The monkey's got a lot of the oranges. So then not only was my leg on fire, but then my hand was on fire. I'm a land mammal. I don't do that. What's up, everybody? My name is Nicholas Dembski, and this is the Live Better Worldwide podcast, where we discuss the skills, income, and inspiration you need to live your best life wherever you choose. In this episode, I'm walking you through 13 mistakes that I've made while traveling the world. Some were painful. Others were costly, some were downright frightening, and others were mistakes that I would be very happy to make again. Here we go. You won't go full of me twice now, baby. I'm sorry, that's the way it is. So one of the first mistakes that I want to talk about that I made while traveling was that I took a job in Colombia that wasn't really good for me. Now I want to talk about this first because I don't want anyone else out there to go and do what I did. So what did I do? Well, I found a job online via an international teaching database. So there's a few that are online where you can find jobs all over the world for teachers. And I found one in Colombia. It was for teaching a first grade class. Um, it was in a really nice international private school. It had a lot of good bonuses to it. For example, in Colombia, you can get a 13th month pay. So that is to say, if you complete 12 months of working there, you get an extra month bonus just on top for completing those 12 months. Um, so there's a lot of good things like that about teaching in Colombia and other places around the world, which is obviously why I took that job in the first place. So this ended up being a mistake because you know, if you go into a job and you take something that's going to be long term for you and you have no idea what it's going into, you're eventually going to find things that don't work out for you that you hadn't anticipated. And even if they're not that big of a problem because you hadn't anticipated them and because you have already stuck yourself in that position, you kind of amplify the effects of any negatives of taking a job like that. So that was a big mistake I made was committing to a place for a long time before I even knew what I was getting myself into. So don't do that if you can help it. But I don't live like the way that I should, oh well. So another mistake that I made was that <laughs> one, one of the mistakes that I made while traveling was actually kind of funny. And I think that it wasn't even necessarily my mistake. I almost think I was trapped into it. And that's when I was crossing over from Costa Rica. <laughs> I'm sorry, I can't say Spanish words anymore because my brain tries to pronounce them in Spanish and then it comes out pronouncing it in English and it just comes out barbled. So, okay, I'm not going to try to just say things naturally. When I was in Costa Rica, that's how Americans say it. Um, I was traveling into Nicaragua, that's how Spanish speakers say it, and I didn't get the stamp into my passport that's supposed to say your, your entry stamp into there. Now, apparently there is another building away from the actual border between Costa Rica and Nicaragua where you go to get that stamp, and then you can cross in. So I didn't realize that. It was my first time crossing that border, and I just crossed. And I even showed my passport to some kind of customs officials there, and he looked at it, and I remember him thinking for a split second, like, something's not right here. He kind of just handed me my passport back, and I crossed into the border. As I was coming out of Nicaragua about a week later, that's when I got caught, and they said, how did you get into Nicaragua? I said, but cross the border right over there. And they're like, they kind of gave me a stink eye, and they were like, sure about that? Like, yeah, crossed right over there at that border. And they're like, well, you don't have a stamp here. You know, yada yada became a problem. And eventually they took me to a back room. They sat me down, some guy with a hat and badges and stuff and come in. And he started talking to me and was just like, well, you can't go anywhere. You got to pay this certain fine until you can do it. And then we can stamp your uh, passport and we can get you out. And so there's a bank across the road. You can go down there and do it, get your money or whatever. So went over there, did that, got hosed on the exchange rate, got hosed on the fee that it takes to take money out. And then I had to pay, I think it was like $150 or something to fine to the actual immigration office. And so at the end of the day, it wasn't that big of a mistake crossing into a country illegally and staying there without ever immigrating technically. Um, but it was a little bit nerve wracking to get put in that back room and have to talk to someone very official and then have to you know pay that fee to make sure I can get out of the country legally. So that's just another mistake. Just be sure that when you're crossing borders that you take a little bit of time to make sure that you know you have your entry stamp. Don't miss that. Okay, 
Okay, so let me get into a scary story, actually, while I was traveling, and this is something I would recommend nobody do while traveling. This was in Cambodia, and I was going from Siem Reap to, I think, Sihanoukville. I decided to take the sleeper bus, so you can sleep on the bus. It's got a little cot for you to lay down. And my God, was this just the most terrifying sleep I've ever had, because I swear the driver was must have been going 70 miles an hour down roads that were swerving left and right and probably four or five times throughout the night my body was literally like thrown in one direction as he hit the brakes or made a swerve or something like that so i don't know how many times i woke up you know in a sleep a pretty normal sleep i can sleep on a bus or on a plane or something and then you just get woken up by your body just shifting like six inches to the right you're getting thrown forward and god that is terrifying man so I would not recommend a Cambodian sleeper bus to anyone. It is very disconcerting. And that's not even the worst part of it. There was one point at about 3 a.m. where we stopped for a bathroom break or something. And there was a couple on there, I think another American couple. And they started yelling at the bus driver about cockroaches on the bus. And they were definitely right. They weren't like the giant cockroaches, but they were like the little small ones that you see in Asia. If you've ever seen them, they're just little itty bitty ones. But they were on the bus for sure. I was seeing them like run around the edges and stuff. But this other couple was freaking out and started yelling at the driver saying they weren't getting back on the bus. They need to send a new bus. They're not getting on. And eventually the bus driver was just like, okay, bye. And like closed the door on them and started backing up because they just weren't getting on the bus. Complaining about the bugs. And then uh, eventually they just broke. And they're like, okay, fine, let us back on the bus. And they got back on. And so, you know, if you're concerned about either getting thrown around while you're sleeping or getting crawled on by insects, do not ride a Cambodian sleeper bus. Because I look to my left as a pip and I look to my right as a robin. I promise y'all no one will stop us. <laughs> okay, so I was in Hong Kong and we were going out to one of my favorite places to spend the weekend it's a place called monkey mountain now it's really easy to get to from the middle of the city but it's called monkey mountain because there are a ton of monkeys out there a whole bunch of i believe they're rhesus macaques but they're all over the place and i made the mistake once of not putting all of my food into my backpack now these monkeys are freaking smart and they are ruthless so i had a bag of oranges in a plastic bag that was just kind of hanging off of the stroller that I was pushing my daughter in as we were making our way up to the mountain and the monkeys found us and they decided that those oranges were their oranges so I could see the monkeys kind of like coming at me and really staring at me much more than what they usually do they usually just don't care much about you but they were definitely focused on me and they kept getting closer and closer and then I could see that they would start to bolt at me. And so like I started to move and tried to fend them off a little bit. And eventually one snuck up behind me and got a hold of the bag, tore it. And that was when like 35 little tangerines just went rolling all over the place. And monkeys just jumped out of the tree in the bushes. And they're just grabbing every single orange. And me and my daughter's family started grabbing the oranges we could. And I think maybe we saved like four of 32 of them. So uh, the monkeys got a lot of the oranges. That was a mistake I made was not paying attention to the wildlife in the area even though i had been to monkey mountain many times and i knew these monkeys were pretty sneaky like this and pretty mischievous i still wasn't prepared and i had that plastic bag of oranges and i got attacked by monkeys and when it was all said and done i looked up there was some stranger filming me so that was fun chasing the grass that looked greener lost sight of my reason to stay Yes, here's another animal story, and this is one that is legitimately, ooh, still gives me shivers up my spine, man. It was not fun. I was going hiking through Hong Kong, a different part of it, in a place called Sai Kong, and was going down this one space where it diverges off a few paths to get to um, several different beaches that are in Sai Kong. And one of the paths goes down is very undeveloped. It's um, a lot of dirt and mud and trees, and it's really narrow. And so everything was fine going through it. But then on the way back in, after we had spent a few hours in the, in the water and the beach and stuff, we went through this area that was really, really muddy, and it had a lot of mosquitoes like coming up out of it. You know, it was really jungly. And so there was one point where I felt one big bite down on my leg. Some giant mosquito must have got me. So I reached out and just slapped it. And when I did that, I looked down, and this far from my boot, just a few inches, was a gigantic Chinese cobra. 
its body was probably about that big along and it was just totally black with these huge black scales on it. It looked like um, Toothless from the movie How to Train a Dragon, that big black dragon that's in there. It reminded me of that, like his leg just curling out of this bush and it was just right next to my boot and ooh, it's giving me those shivers again and goosebumps. I just jumped and screamed and ended up on the other side of the path and thankfully the snake did not turn on me or try to attack me. I think it just went off into the bush, but oh my God, I have never been so abruptly alerted in my life as to look down and see that dragon leg just sticking out right next to my boot. So that's a big mistake I made was not paying attention where I was walking. If that snake had bitten me, we were hours, I mean hours away from hiking to any type of civilization. So I probably would have been in a lot of trouble. That could have been a lot worse. <clears throat> so I escaped that mistake, thankfully. One of the things that I did and that I really regret was last year, I was in Barcelona with my daughter and it was a beautiful place. I loved living in Spain, but I spent all my time there working so hard that I missed a lot of Barcelona. I still got to see the beaches, still got to go on a lot of hikes through town and see a lot of, you know, Antony Gaudi structures and things like that. But there was so much that I missed. And for being there three months, I could have seen the entire city. I could have seen all of Barcelona, but I didn't get to see a lot of it. There were even a lot of main attractions that I didn't get to see because I was just working every day and the days that I wasn't working, I just wanted to relax. And so I ended up spending, you know, a quarter of a year in Barcelona and really didn't get to see much that much of the city. You are going to eat something bad if you travel and there's almost no avoiding it if you eat like I do, which is, hey, there's something new. Let's try that. Hey, there's something new. Let's try that. Here's something new. Let's try that because that's what I do and I don't always know what I'm eating and I really like eating street food particularly you know if you're in Asia they're just all over the place carts and everything and so it's really good to sample all these new foods that you don't know but eventually you're gonna get something bad and I've eaten something bad a few times and I don't mean bad like as in taste bad I mean bad as in you're gonna have some serious digestive issues for a while this has happened to me in Spain Costa Rica and Thailand so it's been at least three times that it's happened you know I got food poisoning I think in Thailand eating some kind of um, pork that they were grilling on the side of the road in Costa Rica I think it was either some seafood or it might have been the ice that was in the water that I was eating with the seafood and then in Spain my best guess was that it was some pate so let me tell you if you haven't had food poisoning it is the worst it feels like you are just dying for like 24 or 36 hours and you will just lose all your fluids through every orifice that you have. And it is no fun, man, especially if you are alone like I was with a child and thinking that you are just going to, you know, expire there on your bathroom floor. It is not fun. Like I said, I've been through it three times and it still hasn't stopped me from traveling in the future. But that doesn't mean it's fun. And it's definitely a mistake to eat that stuff. Ooh, gross. One of the mistakes that I made was falling in love in an airport in Thailand. There was this one girl that I met there a few years ago, and it was actually on my birthday. So I was flying on my birthday from one part of Thailand to the next, and she was actually standing in the line next to us while we were um, checking in to the airport. And I had noticed her then, and I was just like, wow, that's like one of the prettiest girls in the world. And later on, as we were, you know, waiting for the airline to call us up and get in line and stuff she was sitting a few rows down and i saw her again i thought the same thing like damn that girl's super hot and then when the airline eventually called us to get in the line or whatever we were in line and she ended up getting in line right behind us so obviously perfect opportunity to strike up a conversation and <laughs> i can remember the way i started this conversation was i was playing catch with a soft panda with my daughter and I just asked her if she wanted to, to play catch with us. And she was like, okay, sure. And so I tossed her the pan and she just <laughs> totally dropped it. She was like three feet from me and just totally dropped it. So that right then I was like, oh, okay, she's nervous too that I'm talking to her. So that's kind of cute. And I just really enjoyed that. And then we just started talking and we had a nice conversation. And 
Um, we got on the airplane, and then I saw her again after we got off the airplane. We started talking a little bit more, um, hung out for about 15 minutes or so, and then she had to go her way, and I had to go my way. But we've always kept in touch since then, and she's a really sweet girl. But I think the mistake here is that if you're like me, um, you know, a lot of you don't know this. I write poetry. I'm a poet. You know, I feel emotions very feelsy, and so I can fall in love at first sight like that. And so... If you're going to do that and you're going to travel and you have any kind of, you know, human emotion to you, you may very well fall in love with a stranger that you'll never see again other than through Skype and Facebook and stuff. And so it's been years and I'm still partly obsessed with this girl, but I know I'll probably never see her again unless, you know, the world opens back up and I can make it to Thailand. Write your headline and raise it to the sky. This one's a little bit more about facing my fears. And so why would that be a mistake? Well, the mistake was that I signed up for an adventure package when I was traveling for the first time. Didn't really look into it, just signed up for it. Okay, let's go. Well, when we got there, one of the first things we did was place me in a situation that I had been terrified of for years, and that was going into the ocean. You know, I remember just the year before that, I had gone down to Panama City Beach for spring break, and I didn't even want to, like, walk into the ocean because I didn't like jellyfish, I didn't like sharks, I just didn't like messing with the water, and basically what I just told people when they're like, why don't you get in the ocean? I tell them, I'm a land mammal, I don't do that. Um, so anyway, in this adventure package, the very first thing we did, the very first weekend, was go to a place called, I think it was um, Puerto Viejo in Costa Rica, and they took us out on a snorkeling adventure out into the ocean. And obviously I was panicking a little bit before we even got out there. And then, you know, I was still willing to do it. I wasn't going to do it because I already paid for it. And I was like, okay, well, at least we're in a group, you know, no big deal. We'll just be all swimming together. Um, I had on a life vest, goggles or whatever. Uh, got in, the goggles started leaking a little bit. And so I'm panicking just a little bit because I already don't like the ocean. And, you know, I have asthma, so my breathing is, you know, dysregulated at that time as well. So I have water leaking in and I'm nervous and I'm having an asthma attack. And, you know, I just want to get back in the boat, but I also paid for this adventure. So I feel like I have to do it. And then, so as time goes on, I start seeing some really interesting things. You know, I see some really cool fish. I see some gigantic sea urchins. I see a lionfish, which is a, a really poisonous fish that you don't want to mess with. And one of my buddies was swimming really close to it. And it was kind of freaking me out, but it also calmed me a little bit because I was like, oh, okay, super poisonous fish here. One of my buddies is really close to it and not that big of a deal. So it was uh, just calming me bit by bit. And I eventually kind of snorkeled away from the group, you know, just following my own thing, looking at all these different colors or whatever. And there was one point where I was like, okay, I'm going to turn around and swim back to the group when in my path was about a seven foot shark. And I kind of picked my head up and I looked over at where everybody was and they were all you know, on the other side of the shark. And so I just kind of yelled like, hey, there's a shark over here. And I saw the, the leader kind of just like look at me, kind of like raise an eyebrow and then just turn away. But um, the shark was just on the bottom and then it kind of swam up. And it was, you know, I could tell it was a little bit inquisitive about who I was and what I was doing. And it got probably about right there. Oh, let me see that. It was about that close to me. And it came right up to me and I could just see it was looking right at me and it kind of turned its head. And I could just like make eyes with it. And then it kind of just gave me like, I don't think sharks actually have expressions on their faces. They don't have the facial muscles we have, but it kind of gave me like an annoyed look. Like, what are you doing? Get out of here and leave me alone. So it kind of bent away and started swimming this direction. And so I started following it and man, I could have easily reached out and like grabbed its tail or something. It was that close. But there was this one point where it, I saw it kind of like looked back at me and so I was still there. And so it went into this area that was a little bit too shallow for me to snorkel through and it kind of just whisked away through there. And so it really gave me this eye opening experience that, you know, I don't need to be terrified of the ocean like I was, you know, I wouldn't even put my feet in it previously because I just had this experience where a shark came up to me, one of my biggest fears and treated me like I was more of an annoyance than I was breakfast. And so I really think that this was a mistake that was really good to make. I was super happy I made this mistake because it opened up all kinds of doors for me. It got rid of my fear to get into the ocean. You know, I ended up going surfing the next weekend. Now I love surfing. I love snorkeling too. You know, that's one of my favorite things to do in Thailand. And if it hadn't been for accidentally getting into an adventure package that I wouldn't have done had I known what was in it, then 
you know, I wouldn't have ever experienced all these other things that I've experienced. So sometimes making mistakes while traveling can be a really good thing. And eventually this one really changed my life. Okay, let's talk about the time I got lost in Mexico. So this was Dia de los Muertos in 2014. And, you know, I was down in Mexico just doing a little bit of exploring and decided to go to a place called Pátzcuaro. It's really, it's really well known in Mexico because it's a little island where they do the Dia de los Muertos celebration in big style. Um, a lot of boats take people over to this island and I guess the island just gets packed. And it's really, really cool. So I went to the place where you could get onto the boats to go to Pat's Quarrel with a few other expats and travelers that I had met um, just that day. So we were just kind of moving around together. I think it was three or four other people. And so we were making our way to the boats at one point after, you know, walking around and having a few beers and stuff like that. And we realized that those boats are jam-packed. That island looks like it is just filled with tourists and... We don't want to do that you know that just seems crowded and annoying and so we decided to go find something else to do and so that's what we did we said okay well ax that let's just go explore on our own a little bit and so we did well the first thing we found was this lovely mexican family and they were all drinking and having a good time and they had a bunch of these mason jars that were like different colors so they were telling us that there were these different liquors that they had and so they shared them with us and that ended up kicking off a good night and giving us a little bit more bravery to go out into the night because these people told us that, hey, you know, if you get on this bus that goes through here, you can head out in this direction and go find something much more interesting than what you're going to see here. This is just really touristy. Go do that. If that's what you're looking for. I'm like, hey, cool. Let's do that. Yeah. So we got on this bus. It wasn't really much of a bus. It was more like a van with no seats in it. And you just kind of sat in a circle in the back of it. And we didn't really know where we were going. So there was one point where he eventually stopped and there was a parting in the road and there was one light there. And he said, this is the final stop. Time to get off. <laughs> and we just looked at each other and we're like, okay. So we got off in the middle of the woods, basically, where there were just two roads. And we didn't really know where to go. Down this one road, it looked like we could see some fires like off in the distance, like way out in the woods or something. Uh, we, they were quite far away. We couldn't even hear noise from them. So we didn't know what was going on there. And we looked down this other road and we could see a little bit in the distance that there was a hill and there was some light coming off the hill. So we decided, okay, well, let's go check out this hill. Let's go see what's up there, you know. And so we started climbing. We found a path through the jungle. It was really just, you know, roots and knots and trees all over the place. We were kind of meandering our way up this hill. <clears throat> and that's when we got into this town, little Mexican pueblo. And it was almost completely shut down. I mean, everything was shuttered. It was so quiet. It was super eerie, but we could still see the lights coming from one part of town. So we're like, okay, what's going on here? Started walking through town. We came around this corner and here is a pickup truck. We walked up to the truck and we just asked them what was going on. And they pointed us through this gate. And inside this gate, we walked in and it just opened up into this beautiful cemetery that was covered in all these orange and yellow flowers and candles and there were families sitting around all of their ancestors' graves. And on each one of their graves was their favorite food and their favorite drinks. And they were all sitting there quietly and having conversations and stuff. And it was just really beautiful, really nice experience. We hung out there about 20 or 30 minutes just walking around and examining and just talking to people as well. I actually met a family who was from Michigan at the time down there. They were wearing a Michigan hoodie. They were from Detroit, so that was really interesting that we would meet out in the middle of Mexico like that where there were no other tourists. And so that's just the beginning of the night. Um, we eventually left there and, you know, we played with fireworks with some little kids. We had some street food again that was just outside of the cemetery. And eventually we decided that we would go try to find something else. What were those campfires that we saw down the other street? So we made our way back down the hill and decided to start walking the other road, looking for those campfires. Well, it turned out those campfires were way out in the middle of some field. These fields were half mud, half water. And so we weren't about to meander our way through them, trying to get out to these fires and figure out what was going on. So we just kept following the road. And we eventually came to another Pueblo about probably an hour later that was just totally run down. I mean, there was nothing to this town. Every single window was smashed. All the buildings were all busted and crumbly. Right at the entrance of the town, there was a cemetery, and the cemetery had, like, roots overgrowing the tombstones, like, just fallen wood everywhere. It was just in disarray. And so this place looked like it had been abandoned, abandoned for just ages. Well, we walked all the way through this town. Eventually, we got to the end, and if you took a right down at the end of it, there was this huge arching gate. So, okay, we went through there. And then behind this was 
a party, just a really awesome party. There was a stage and there was like, um, they do this interesting kind of thing where they make fun of Spanish people in Mexico by putting on like pale faces and blonde hair and these interesting um, clothes and stuff and then doing these silly dances. So they're just making fun of Spanish people as like, you know, the conquistadors and stuff. And so that's kind of what it's about, I guess, that play. I didn't particularly understand everything, but there were some other really cool things. You know, the kids were running around with these pumpkins asking for gifts. It's kind of like their Halloween style, I guess. And then the funnest part of it was that people were playing um, fireball hockey. So they had this bucket full of balls that were soaked in like ether or something. And then they would just throw them onto the field and light them on fire and you'd play hockey with them. And eventually they would like explode because someone like slap shot it too hard or something, you know, and it'd break and then they'd get another ball and set it back on fire and you play again. And so I eventually got to play and it was super fun. I even scored a goal. Hiya! Probably one of the best experiences of my life was scoring a fireball goal. <laughs> it was just so much fun. <laughs> oh my God. So eventually this is where the mistake came in was that. We were out in the middle of this Pueblo and it was getting to be about midnight. And you might think of Mexico as like a really warm, hot, humid place. But if you were out in the desert like we were, it gets freezing cold at night. So it was probably about midnight, getting close to 1230. And me and these other travelers, we weren't prepared at all. I mean, we were dressed for the daytime. Everyone had on t-shirts and stuff. We had no warm clothes. We had no food. We had no water, nothing like that. Uh, the entire party started to shut down, so all the food stands were closed. There was nowhere to get water. I already told you what the town looked like. There was no Airbnbs. There was no hostels. There was nowhere to stay. And so we realized that it's midnight, and we are trapped. There's no bus. There's no transportation. We are in the middle of this Pueblo, and there is nowhere we can go and nothing we can do. And so we went back to that cemetery that I told you about that had all the fallen brush and roots and stuff like that. And we were like, we're going to grab some of that wood, we're going to bring it back, we're going to use one of these fireballs, one of these hockey fireballs, we're going to build a fire out of it, and we're just going to sleep like that around the concrete. So that was what our plan was, and we started getting to it, and eventually <clears throat> we made it to the cemetery, and as we were collecting wood, just some voice came out of the darkness, speaking something in Spanish that I didn't understand, and it scared the bejesus out of me, but um, apparently it was someone offering to help us. And again, you know, I didn't understand the Spanish at the time. And so I was really nervous, but, um, it was these, these vagabonds. It was these people that would go around to festivals like this and they had their own little truck and they would sell their little like art trinkets and paint them and stuff like that. And so they had their own little camp set up and they invited us to come over. I think they obviously recognized that we were lost and had nowhere to go. And so, you know, very generous of them. They invited us to come over. They gave us all blankets, let us sit around the fire. Um, they gave us a place to sleep, which was an old trampoline that they carried around with them. And so this trampoline had holes and stuff in it. But me and the other tourists, like we were still so cold, even with the blankets and the fire, that what we did is just, we just all huddled up into like a big row of spoons. And just we slept like that together, all four or five of us. And that ended up being the whole night like that. Woke up really early, didn't get much sleep. And these people made coffee for us. And I think it was their own coffee because it kind of tasted like tree bark but it was still coffee better than nothing you know they were super generous and they pointed us to the next bus that was going to come through and that was when i decided that um, it was time for me to get back to where i was in Caretaro with a friend of mine and to part my ways with these tourists who i went on this crazy adventure with and that's what i did i went back home and i think they continued out towards the coast and i've kept up with them a little bit on facebook but man that was definitely a frightening but also enlightening night you know it was scary because we got lost and i thought we could freeze to death but it also taught me a lot about getting rid of the fear of the unknown you know i didn't know the language i didn't know the people very well you know it's the middle of the night it's dark it's scary you know all the stories that it's about to happen to you you're going to end up in a hole in the desert none of that happened everyone was super sweet the mexicans were great people even those people who were vagabonds and had i'm sure almost no money judging by you know, the look of their truck and stuff like that, that they were probably just surviving, you know, day to day on the, the art sales that they made. They were so generous to, you know, give us their blankets, give us coffee, you know, give us their fire, give us a place to sleep. And so that really changed my perspective about travel and made me much more open to people around the world. And now I'm just like, 
I'm not afraid of anyone. You know, if people gives me like a bad vibe or a scary feeling in myself, I just know that, oh, okay, well, that's just, you know, my stupid brain being stupid again. And it'll be just like Mexico where people will be super sweet and everything will be okay, I'm sure. And it always has been too. I don't know what that thing was on my table there that I just flicked away. It looks like a piece of chocolate. Feel the world's been around again. I got residency when I didn't need it, and that was a huge mistake. I went and gained temporary residency in Mexico last year because I was planning on staying there a full year and getting my daughter into the school and getting my own vehicle and getting a house and stuff like that. I think the biggest mistake I made here that I will just quickly say because I've already made a full video about this right here, instead of getting residency in Mexico was just go there on the six month tourist visa and then I could have seen how well I liked the area. And then after those six months, I could have come back and been like, okay, well now I want the residency. I know I want to stay or whatever, or I could have just have left. Well, instead, I got the residency prior and this made it so I had to, you know, pay the residency fees, go through all the processes and things like that. It was a lot of time, a lot of wasted money, probably around $1,500, something like that. Um, and so that was a big mistake was getting residency before I was 100% sure I needed it just because I thought I needed it and I thought it would be useful to me. So this was another time that I fell in love and this was in Spain. Um, I try to stay off the dating apps now like Tinder and Bumble because they just end up, I don't know, making me feel bad in the long run. You know, it's been, I've been using them for like five years or something like that. I'm still a single dad, so obviously it's not going that well. Um, but I was using Tinder while I was in Spain and I met a girl who was just awesome. She was really beautiful, uh, very smart, um, really fun to hang out with and she was really good with Auburn because she did meet her a few times and so obviously i had crazy feelings for this girl but again you know i was only in spain for three months so i had to leave and i actually did try to get residency to go back to spain but it's not as easy to get it as it is to mexico so i wasn't able to complete their visa form i couldn't get back into spain and so you know i didn't really know what to do and um things have just kind of fizzled out since then i think she probably has another boyfriend now and stuff like that and so you know obviously like i said i get all the feels i'm a bit poetic about things and so when i fall in love it lasts a long time um, even when i'm traveling you know and it can happen quickly for me and i know for other people that's probably a little bit freaky and scary and i imagine that's probably what happened to her and so my mistake there was just I don't know. It's not even really a mistake because I don't think it's a mistake to fall in love and have feelings for people and get your heart broken or whatever because you learn from each one. So was it a mistake? No. No, I take it back. This was not a mistake. It's okay to fall in love. Go ahead and fall in love and get your heart broken. It's fine. Never stressing, just addressing bank rolls. Sipping no tequila, counting pesos. I slapped a jellyfish. Yeah, that wasn't very smart. And it's not that there was actually a jellyfish and I just slapped it. It's that I was surfing in Nicaragua, and while I was out there, there was one point where I was just hanging my legs in the water waiting for a wave where I felt something nab me on the leg, and I didn't know what it was, but it didn't take very long before it felt like a version of fire and electricity and metal stinging me all at the same time. Now, I didn't really know what it was at the time I just had a really quick infant reflex and my reflex was to slap it and get whatever it was on my leg off of me so what that did was just send my hand through the stingers of this jellyfish and pushed it away from me so then not only was my leg on fire but then my hand was on fire so I got out of the water uh, went up to the little restaurant there that was there, asked them for, you know, some acidic juice, some lime or something. Man, did that burn for probably like 15 minutes. But yeah, that was a big mistake. If you ever get hit by a jellyfish in the leg, don't slap it because then you're just going to make things a lot worse. However, I don't know what I could have done to make it worse. You know, I couldn't have looked down into the water and like pulled the jelly's bell away and flicked it away gingerly. You know, it was just very instinctual and it was very painful. So jellyfish, don't slap them, apparently. If you're interested in learning more about the travels that I've gone through, go ahead and click right here so you can watch the playlist that has every single Live Better Worldwide podcast episode on it. Don't first get to <laughs> don't forget to subscribe before you go, and I will see you next time. Peace.